Hi, Duox. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I am going to share with you lecture one, which is an introduction to um, the history of exercise physiology and also some kind of introductory um, terminology. Oops, why are you doing that? Associated with um, exercise science. So it is currently uh, June 23rd and I am recording this. Um, you can see that I'm kind of big right now. Um, I'm looking forward to being back with you guys this fall uh, in a couple months after these two little babies are born. So um, hopefully you won't mind a couple weeks of some um, video lecturing and then we'll get back to business uh, as soon as I can get back to campus. Okay. So again, just some kind of general terminology when we think about um, what is exercise physiology. So again, um, you've all taken anatomy and physiology classes before and you know, let me get my pointer out here. Anatomy has to do with the structures and the location of those structures, the organization, um, naming those items and understanding how things are organized. Okay. Um, physiology takes that a step further and helps us apply that information to understand how things work. Right. So understanding um, the anatomy is important in terms of our ability to understand how things function, how things work together in order to um, complete coordinated activities within the body and exercise physiology, um, which is absolutely my favorite thing to talk about. This is what my PhD is in, um, has to do with the application of how the body works as it relates to exercise. Okay. So exercise serves as a stressor to the body. Um, we can consider that a planned deviation from homeostasis. Um, so um, lots of different things that we can look at within the realm of exercise physiology. And we'll talk about um, what some of those different branches are here coming up. But um, it's important for us to understand that we're really blending a lot of things in order for us to get an understanding of how the body works under the stressor known as exercise. Okay, so again, certainly we need to understand the structure. We also need to understand the function of each system when we're at rest without providing any type of stressor. Um, biochemistry allows us to look at um, how we can chemically modify different molecules. So again, um, like metabolism, for example, is basically all applied biochemistry. So um, understanding how we can manipulate molecules so that we can put them in the form of ATP so that we can use them or we can store foods, um, things like that. Um, physics is very important. Again, if you think about biomechanics, a lot of you have already taken biomechanics uh, class, but again, understanding lever systems and how we can create um, efficient movement as it relates to sport or activities of daily living. Um, physics is certainly the cornerstone um, when we think about biomechanics. Uh, math, again, when we think about research and, um, you know, the science, I guess, associated with exercise physiology. Um, we have to use statistics in order for us to understand whether or not we found something to be significant. Okay. Biology allows us to take a look at what's going on at that cellular level and understand, um, you know, how that might play a role in determining how we might understand what's happening with the body during exercise. So again, when we think about, first of all, when we think about just general human physiology, it's pretty freaking cool to imagine all the coordinated things that are going on in order for us to just live, right? So again, um, if you remember back to um, physiology, right? Um, or two twenty um, anatomy and phys, part two, right? So understanding the cardiac conduction system. So we have to have this electrical signal that's being sent from the SA node to the AV node, and it's going to be coordinated in nature. And we can understand how um, the myocardial tissue is organized at the cellular level and why that sets us up for success um, every single day, right? So think about just the heart in general. Um, again, I'm just choosing one organ that I think is pretty freaking cool, but think about all the 
coordinated things that have to happen in order for your heart to beat. Okay, so we have to have the electrical system correct. All the tubes have to be arranged appropriately with no holes or blockages or things like that, right? Um, all that's pretty freaking cool. And we get it right every single time, right? So again, if your heart beats 60 times per minute, every minute, every hour, every day, for your entire life from like when you're, you know, four weeks old or five weeks old ish um, in uterum until the day you die, it never messes up. So that's pretty freaking cool to think about how much coordination must occur, how sophisticated this um, machine is in order for those things to happen, right? So then you apply this whole thing known as exercise, right? Um, how do we change these coordinated events during exercise to allow us to, you know, rise up and overcome these stressors? Um, so that's pretty freaking cool too. So again, when we think about exercise physiology, we have to understand what's going on at rest in order for us to understand how applying that exercise stressor might affect how the coordination of that particular system works. Okay. And then lastly, adaptation to exercise over time. This is freaking cool too. So again, the reason that we train in athletics, for example, is because we want to see adaptation, right? We want our bodies to get better than what it, than what your body was the day before, right? If you weren't going to improve, then you wouldn't practice, right? We would just show up and, okay, well, we're going to play basketball today or, okay, we're going to run a race or whatever, right? Um, and it would be based on talent or luck or who's mentally tougher or something along those lines. But fortunately, we can adapt to exercise. We can modify our bodies um, based on the stressors that we regularly give them. Okay. So adaptation to exercise over time is pretty freaking cool too. Okay. So again, when we think about exercise physiology, it's important for us to understand the difference between acute exercise and chronic exercise. And these are essentially your, <coughs> sorry, these are essentially your two different branches of exercise physiology. So acute exercise has to do with the modifications or changes that are going to occur during one single exercise bout, okay? Um, so for example, if I decide I want to go outside and go for a run, okay? What are some things that are gonna happen to me when I complete that run, right? So I'm going to see an increase in heart rate. I'm going to see an increase in breathing frequency. I'm going to start sweating. I'm going to um, have the release of some hormones that make me feel good, right? So all of those things are acute modifications, okay? So those happen as a result of that one single exercise bout, okay? So when we talk about acute exercise, it can be any mode, right? So I gave an example of running. So aerobic exercise, we can look at resistance training. Um, we can look at yoga. We can look at flexibility. We can look at plyometrics. So again, it doesn't matter what mode we're talking about. We're simply talking about what are the changes that occur during that one single exercise bout, okay? Now, when we think about chronic exercise, these are the adaptations that we make over time, okay? So again, um, if I go for a run every day for many weeks or many months or many years, right? How is my body different as a runner as opposed to somebody who doesn't exercise regularly, right? So what are the modifications that my body will make to make me more efficient, maybe at rest, but certainly during exercise um, as a result of regularly doing that activity, right? And again, we can think about chronic exercise as it relates to endurance, as it relates to resistance training, as it relates to anaerobic sport, right? So something like uh, volleyball or baseball, for example. Um, so again, and yoga or flexibility stuff as well. So, so again, we can look at what are those chronic changes? So how is my body different as a runner, as a volleyball player, as a regular resistance trainer or whatever, um, than someone who doesn't do those activities, okay? So um, this is just fun. I'm not going to test you in a great amount of detail about um, anything in this section. I just think it's super interesting. Um, 
I, again, I, I want you to watch this and actually pay attention, but don't like, you don't have to like go crazy studying this particular section. Um, just kind of get a general idea of, of what's going on here. Um, I think it's important for us to understand, you know, how did exercise phys kind of get started and where are we going in this field, right? So where, where are we going in, in regards to, um, you know, what are the, what are the questions that we still currently have as it relates to the body and exercise? exercise. So um, thinking back long time ago, uh, Plato said, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodic methodological physical exercise save it and preserve it. Okay. Um, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we have found the safest way to health. So again, um, things that I would still consider to hold very, very much true. Um, we had good ideas about these long, long ago. So what was happening 400 BC? Heavy exercise was discouraged because heavy exercise increased your body temperature. And we knew that an increase in body temperature, like having a fever was bad because that was associated with disease. So you could do like some light activities, but you weren't encouraged to do anything where you would really get your body temperature up too much. And again, that makes sense if you think about, you know, um, disease and, and what we knew or what we understood about disease at that particular time. So um, something interesting there, that was kind of a starting point for us. Okay, move forward to 160 AD. Um, this guy, Gallen, he was the first, I guess, true exercise physiologist. Um, he defined exercise as any type of vigorous movement with an increase in respiration. Um, other things related to this guy, he did something known as vivisection of monkeys. Um, vivisection, if any of you had anatomy and phys with me in one of the summer sessions, would know that that means live dissection. So he was live taking live monkeys and dissecting them and seeing what was going on um, when he did so. So that's pretty creepy, right? Um, he also um, started to understand the difference between uh, what we consider agonist and antagonist muscles. So he kind of keyed those terms. So understanding um, that one muscle causes this action, an opposite muscle must cause the opposite action, right? So agonist, antagonist muscles. Um, he wasn't, he didn't really have the, his understanding of blood correct though. Um, he thought it was delivered and used and then regenerated in the heart or liver. He didn't really know where it was regenerated, but he thought it was regenerated in one of those um, two locations. So a little bit off there, but um, some good ideas as it relates to, um, you know, that the muscle action and that sort of thing. Um, fast forward a lot. Here you can see 1700s German physiologists describe an increase in oxygen consumption during exercise. Okay, so they started to understand that if I do something such as exercise that's strenuous in nature, I need to have more oxygen in order to do so. Okay. Um, let's see, what did he, what did they find in Germany? They, uh, they found that the average person uses 24 liters of oxygen per hour and um, during exercise they could use about 63 liters of oxygen per hour. Okay. Um, and this was thought that it was the level of the lungs, like the lungs were consuming the oxygen. So that's what they kind of thought um, kind of in the beginning here. 1889, um, the physiology of bodily exercise was written by this French guy, Lagrange. Most of his concepts were wrong. Um, also right around this time, um, we created what's known as a gasometer um, or a Douglas bag. And a Douglas bag is basically the first way in which we could um, measure oxygen consumption. Um, so that was right around the same time that this uh, book came out. 1919, The Physiology of Muscular Exercise was written um, as well. No real research was being done at this time. They were just kind of like making stuff up as they went. They're like, oh, this sounds good. Like, that's probably how this works. They weren't doing like experiments or anything to figure out if those things were true. So that's kind of interesting. Scientific method wasn't really around yet, quite yet. Okay. 
uh, 1900s to 1930s, we're having an increase in educational, um, medical, and graduate programs within the United States. Hence, there was an, uh, an increased desire to understand how things were working and, and why they were working the way they were. Okay, so at this time, um, we were really starting to lay the groundwork for understanding basic human physiology. Okay, so again, as we started to have more education, more medical um, professions, okay, um, people were starting to try and understand how the body actually works, right? In order to fix the body, I need to know how it works regularly or when it's in its healthy form, okay? Um, so as we started to kind of understand this base layer of basic human physiology, the next step was its application to exercise as well as its application to disease, right? So again, we have to understand how this system works regularly, and then we can apply these different scenarios that affect how it functions, such as exercise or disease, in order for us to gain more understanding of how this um, machine might work. Okay, 1926, um, A.V. Hill, this is one of the founders of exercise physiology. He established the Harvard Fatigue Lab at Harvard. Um, several scientists worked here in this Harvard Fatigue Lab, and they were starting to lay the groundwork for both exercise physiology and also environmental physiology. So again, we're now applying a couple different stressors. We wanna understand how does exercise affect the system? How does cold or hot temperatures affect the system as well, okay? Um, so what was going on in this particular lab? Again, they were starting to do actual scientific research. So using and applying the scientific method here. Um, they were looking at research on exercise, nutrition, and health. They were also looking at um, how exercise might affect our aging capacity. And they were also doing lots of research for the Army, Navy, and Air Force as well. Again, we wanted to create fit, healthy, strong soldiers. Um, let's see what else I got here. So cellular metabolism. So we understood that there was a link between energy metabolism and heat. So we could, we start, we're starting to understand here when we think about um, nutrition and metabolism that um, when I am using energy, I'm also producing heat. Um, it was initially thought that heat was used to cause the muscle fibers to shorten, right? So again, if you think, remember back to the sliding filament theory and the way in which we have concentric contractions occurring, they thought that heat was needed in order to like activate those pathways. Um, however, it was A.V. Hill that discovered that muscles used energy um, and that lactate or glycogen could be used to allow these muscle contractions. So again, those were serving as kind of fuels in order for us to achieve muscle contraction. He won the Nobel Prize for this. He also figured out, like we mentioned, that heat is produced when muscles do work. And he also coined a term known as oxygen debt, which we, we will actually talk about in uh, lecture two in this class when we think about energy metabolism. So again, a lot of great groundwork laid by A.V. Hill. Okay. So again, just kind of a nice summary chart here of, of what was going on at that Harvard fatigue lab. Shit ton of stuff, right? They were doing a lot of things really early on here um, that have really laid the, the foundation for, um, you know, what we still know to be true today as it relates to physiology, right? So metabolism, under, understanding oxygen debt. So um, again, we'll talk about that in, in lecture number two, understanding how carbohydrates and fats were used for energy. Um, environmental fit. So again, very concerned with cold temperatures, um, heat, humidity, altitude, um, looking at some of these um, clinical issues as well, aging, um, physical fitness. So the Harvard step test, they created the Harvard step test, which is um, basically the same thing as like the three minute step test, which you probably did like when you took personal fitness. Um, so, and we'll do actually do it in this class as well. So again, a classic component associated with estimating um, aerobic fitness here. Um, what else? They were interested in physical fitness as it related to health benefits. So again, um, you know, sports performance wasn't really a huge concern at this point. We were concerned, again, think about 30s and 40s uh, 
with the war going on. It was all about health as it related to our soldiers and things like that. Um, so again, very interested in health benefits, particularly for the military um, personnel. Okay. Here you can see the um, three minute step test uh, going on. So this is kind of how they had this set up. They would apply uh, additional stressors. So you can see that these guys have backpacks on. Maybe they're military. So maybe these are the packs that they would be um, carrying regularly. Maybe they're comparing two different packs or something along those lines um, while doing this three minute step test. Okay. Here you can see um, something related to an environmental lab. Um, so we'll we'll talk about uh, one one thing that I think is really cool is this concept. It's called a clow unit, and a clow unit tells us the thermal resistance of of um, wearing a lightweight business suit. So the lightweight business suit is kind of like the standard to compare to. And then check this guy out. He's got like maybe more like a sweatsuit on. He's got his hood up, things like that. But again, in the 1930s, 1940s, like this is what the normal person wore to work. So um, this was kind of the standard to compare to. So um, a clo unit, again, you can see here uh, looking at oxygen consumption uh, differences, maybe with uh, the guy in a sweatsuit versus the guy in a normal business suit. So, okay. Again, here you can see this right here is a Douglas bag. So this shows us, um, or this helps us to calculate. This was the first way in which we can measure oxygen consumption, um, which was super, super time consuming. Um, we'll get a measure oxygen consumption with the metabolic cart in this class. And um, it, it's all calculated through the computer. So you get your results right away, okay? This thing freaking would take hours and hours. So maybe we would have this guy do one test on the bike here. And then it might take a researcher eight hours or so to analyze um, what was going on, how much oxygen he actually consumed um, while he was on the bike. So again, um, we've really progressed in that area, but this was, this was what we started with. Uh, let's see what else we had some uh, things going on in other areas of the, the, the world as well. So we had altitude uh, physiology going on in Scandinavia and also looking at substrate metabolism. So understanding which fuels we were using in various scenarios. Um, so other places in the world were also contributing to our understanding of um, exercise physiology. Um, I have to put a plug in here. Um, this is where I graduated is Springfield College. It's in Massachusetts. Um, Peter Karpovich is considered one of the founders of exercise physiology. Um, he was working at Springfield College from the 20s to the 60s. Um, he played a really important role in physical education. So um, physical education and ba basketball, basketball, the birthplace of basketball is Springfield College, um, but also physical education, the YMCA, those things were all like created at Springfield College. So a lot of things were going on um, during this time. Volleyball was created just up the road in Holyoke, Massachusetts, which is like 15 minutes from Springfield. So a lot going on as it relates to sport, exercise, physical education um, during this time, okay? Um, so again, Karpovich was doing a ton of different research. He wanted to understand how weightlifting for athletes might um, be helpful, right? Also, why would be why would aerobic exercise um, promote a healthy lifestyle for the average person as well? And then also understanding this connection between why we need physical activity and what is its role as it relates to general human physiology, right? So again, looking at those chronic changes associated with just regularly being active. Um, so again, uh, Springfield College would have been one of the first places that had a weight room and actually required athletes to um, do strength training. I know that Loras College didn't have a weight room until, gosh, you, you could probably ask Tommy Colt to tell you the exact year, um, but it was at least the 1980s before we were getting this, right? And this guy was doing it in the 30s, right? So again, um, he was really one of the first ones to kind of get this concept going that, hey, strength training might be good for our athletes to be able to do. Okay. Um, 1960s, the public began accepting that physical activity was good. 
Okay, so again, we were starting to see that physical activity um, slows the effects of aging. We also were starting to see that physical activity could prevent chronic disease and could help us when in uh, rehabbing injuries, right? So again, if you had something that was injured, instead of just like, you know, making you sedentary and not using that for however many weeks, months, or whatever, right? Um, if any of you have torn your ACL before, you know that they want you doing things almost immediately after that ACL is torn. So we can use exercise and physical activity as a way to enhance our rehabilitation. And those of you that are going on to athletic training and physical therapy, that's right up your alley. What else do we got here? I got some notes on this section. Um, and until the late 1960s, again, most exercise physiology, physiology we were focused on kind of the, the body's whole response to exercise. Um, there was a, not much going on as it relates to like cellular metabolism. So we weren't focused in um, at a cellular level in regards to understanding what was happening with exercise. That makes sense. We have to understand kind of this broad picture before we can really zoom in and take a look at what's going on cellularly. Um, the history of ex-phys continues to write itself based on technological advances, um, particularly when we think about biochemical and cellular responses, right? So again, the better able we are to take a look at what's going on um, either under a microscope or at that microscopic level, the more we'll actually be able to understand here. Um, exercise physiologists need to be well grounded in biochemistry, biology, and genetics. Um, so again, those are important keys when we move forward in this field um, to allowing us to continue to answer more questions about exercise and its benefits and that sort of thing. Okay. So again, you know, we've, we've talked here briefly about the history associated with um, exercise physiology and kind of um, where we came from. And I think that it, this is really important for us to understand in order for us to see um, where we're continuing to go, right? So in order for us to really truly appreciate what it is that we know about exercise physiology, I think it's really neat for us to be able to see where, you know, where we've came, where we came from with this, okay? So research serves as kind of this, our foundation for understanding how the body works and how it might work under various stressors, okay? So again, what's our, what is the body's response to acute exercise? Again, we can answer that question via doing the scientific method, doing research, right? How do our bodies adapt over time? Okay, so again, providing various stressors and understanding what's the optimal stressor. And is it different if you're a male or a female or if you're 15 or if you're 25 or if you have this genetic predisposition? Okay, so again, understanding how our body might adapt over time based on a variety of factors, right? What's the most effective way to train, right? So we want to know, I guess, really two different branches here. What's the minimum that I have to do to be healthy? And also the other end of the spectrum is what's the maximum that I can do and still see myself improve as it relates to sport or exercise performance, okay? Um, and is there some sort of middle ground, right? What's the optimal level for either of those variables? If I'm interested in improving my health or if I'm interested in improving my sports performance, okay? So understanding what's the most effective um, exercise prescription that we could provide. Right? Um, and then lastly, what are ways in which we can enhance performance? Um, again, that is like my bread and butter for my research is understanding different recovery methods, right? Appropriate nutritional strategies, okay? So understanding what I can do in order to enhance my performance in the most effective way. This, I just love this. So um, again, no, no test questions or anything on this. Um, I'm a track coach. You probably already know that, but I coach high school boys uh, track at Western Dubuque High School. And um, this shows you the progression of, I just made this chart because I'm a psycho and I think it's interesting. So 110 meter hurdle, Olympic winning times. Okay, so here you can see all the Olympics up until 2008. Okay. Um, to give you a good reference point, like for Iowa high school boys, 
Um, if you run a 15 flat, you're going to make it to the Iowa high school state meet. Okay. If you run a low 14, like a 14, three, 14, four, somewhere in there, you're probably going to win a state title as an Iowa high school boy. Okay. So check this out before the 1940s, my high school boys would be winning Olympic titles, right? They would be winning gold medals at the Olympics. Okay. Check this out from the first Olympic, uh, 110 meter hurdles to the next time they did it four years ago, they dropped three seconds. That's absolutely insane. I would be surprised if I had a high school boy, they must really suck as a freshman in order to improve three seconds over their high school careers with me, right? So again, just the, the, my point here is not that, you know, were these people less athletic than these people? No, absolutely not. They have the same genetic makeup in 2008 as what we did in 1896 what's changed is technique okay so understanding what's the most efficient way to move and we would know that through research and also what's the most efficient way to train right so whatever we were doing here wasn't good right what else could we have progressed during that time certainly equipment Okay, so again, I now have spikes that are carbon plated and they're set up so that, um, you know, I can maximize my performance when I hit my foot on the ground, right? So again, think about how much just this one example, one sport has progressed um, over, over time. And I'm such a nerd that I gave you more than just one example. So here you can see, um, again, these are all men's olympic um winning marathon times okay so to give you a reference point i know many women okay friends that have run faster times than these times here at the top right again we've dropped almost an hour in our you know olympic winning marathon times and again this has to do with all those same factors we mentioned with the hurdles right I know how to train. I know how to hydrate. I know how to fuel myself. I know how to help myself recover between exercise sessions so that I can get more out of my next exercise session and so on and so forth. Okay. Here's shot put. Oh, I used to have this in my notes. I must have taken it out for, uh, I can't remember what's good for meters for shot put. Um, but again, I just want you to appreciate this upward curve. And again, we're going to continue to improve on all of these fronts as we, as we continue to research and find ways to um, continue to improve our training, as well as many other factors such as recovery, nutrition, um, and then uh, like your equipment as well. So shoes, um, you know, uh, techniques, things like that. Okay. So again, when we think about types of tests and how we know what we know in exercise physiology, um, we have field tests, which are great for large estimates, um, but the, the issue is we're not able to control for extrinsic variables. So maybe I went to this like 5K race here and I um, got all the times at the end of the race of all these participants. And then I also surveyed them when they finished and I asked them how much money they paid for their uh, running shoes. Okay. Again, um, what I might find would be that, you know, in general, the more people pay for running shoes, the um, faster their 5k time is. Okay. However, I didn't control for the fact that, um, you know, this guy, um, got injured and wasn't able to train. He's just doing it for fun. This girl was at Jen Ricky's last night and she's not feeling super great and she's just going to run with her friend and she's not putting her full effort in. Okay. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I'm not able to control for any of these extrinsic variables, but if I have 300 people in this race that I'm surveying, then it gives me a fairly decent idea. Okay. 
A lab test uh, or a lab field test, again, minimal equipment will be needed. We'll use approximate lab conditions. Again, this will be more accurate than doing a field test. However, not as accurate as a lab test where we can use sophisticated equipment, rigid controls, um, and again, be a lot more accurate. Okay, so um, here you can see the use of a metabolic cart, um, which we will use in this class in two different labs. Um, so we'll be able to actually measure your resting metabolism um, via looking at how much oxygen you're using. And then we'll also do a VO2 max test um, where we're able to understand how much oxygen we're utilizing as well. And then we'll be able to compare that to a couple different lab tests um, or, lab, or lab field tests um, where we're able to estimate those same variables. When we think about different equipment um, that allows us to do scientific research, um, an er ergometer is important. So an ergometer is a device that allows us to standardize the amount and rate of the person's physical work, okay? So a cycle ergometer, so um, again, I have to be able to standardize the work so that I know, you know, exactly what level it's at. So I can't just have like a um, you know, go out there and do a moderate intensity. I have to know how much wattage that subject is putting into the pedals in order for me to be able to control and standardize that. Okay. A treadmill, easy to standardize. So um, a treadmill will tell you the speed and also the incline at which you're running or walking. So again, that can all be standardized. Um, we can also look at the work that you're doing based on your um, body weight as well. Okay. Um, arm ergometer, so those are things that are like you sit stationary and you like do this with your arms. It's like arm cycle. Again, same thing as what we see with the cycle ergometer. Um, we can use that to, um, you know, uh, standardize how much wattage I'm putting in with my arms. Okay. Tethered swimming and a swimming flume. So a swimming flume would be the same as like an endless pool. So um, basically there's a jet here and the jet... Um, here is controlled and we can standardize how fast that jet is going and you basically like swim in place against the jet okay a swimming flume is like uh um i'm sorry i said those backwards the so swimming flume is the jet so a swimming flume is like a jet that comes out at you and you swim against it like a stationary um like a stationary swim okay uh, tethered swimming is like you're connected to a string. So there's like a string that ties on to like your waist and then it's tied onto a pole and it'll determine how much work you're doing based on how much tension you create against that string. Okay. So the tethered swimming, you're connected via a string to like a pole and then the swimming flume, I've got jets coming at you and you're swimming basically against a current in place and we can determine how much work you're doing. Um, because we can determine how fast those jets are going. Okay, so we think about, you know, um, science and the research process. Again, a lot of you, if not all of you, have taken research methods. So um, again, this is something that you're familiar with, but we'll be doing five different labs. Five labs? Yes. In this class where we're going to um, certainly apply these principles, but also, I think it's really important for you to understand the research process because this is how we know what we know, right? And so again, this is certainly intermeshed within all the material within this course um, because it's so, so important in terms of us understanding what it is that we know and how that's ever changing as well, okay? So again, um, the, the research process. So we start with observations, reading scientific literature. We're gonna create a research question and a hypothesis based on where there's gaps in the current literature. So what do we know? What do we not know? Um, test hypothesis. So um, again, I'm going to set up my methodology and, and test my subjects, do some data analysis. Um, then I'm able to interpret my data and draw conclusions uh, based on what it is that I found, okay? Based on what those conclusions are, uh, we wanna do something with those results so we can submit them to a manuscript, to a peer reviewed journal. Um, we can present them in a variety of settings as well. So as to share our information about this particular topic, okay? 
we think about the variables associated with, uh, you know, setting up a scientific experiment, um, the independent variable and the dependent variable. So the independent variable is the variable that you manipulate or the variable that you modify and the dependent variable is what you're measuring. Okay, so again, let's say I wanted to know the effect of, um, I don't know, carb loading versus not carb loading on uh, 5k time. Okay, so again, my independent variable I'm looking at is whether or not they're carb loading. So carb loading or not carb loading. And then my dependent variable, what I'm measuring then was how fast they were able to run a 5k, for example. Okay. Again, when we think about these factors, so dependent variable is what I'm measuring and independent variable is what I'm controlling. Um, generally that independent variable will fall on the X axis. I know it's weird to think about we're controlling time, um, but in this particular example, we're looking at blood lactate levels, integrated exercise test. Okay, so again, um, each like session down here, we're making the intensity a little bit harder on the treadmill. And then we're measuring their lactate um, to see how that changes over time. Okay, so lactate is our dependent variable and that'll be charted on the Y axis. Um, a couple other terms to keep in mind when we think about the application of the scientific method, validity, reliability, and objectivity. So validity, does the test measure what it's supposed to measure? So maybe I wanted to um, determine, let's say I gave the football team uh, an energy drink and we wanted to know if this energy drink was going to enhance their performance or not, okay? And so in order for me to quantify performance, I have to do some different exercise tests, okay? So for the football team, um, imagine that I give half of them this energy drink and half of them do not get the energy drink. And then we all go out to the track and I tell them to run a mile on the track. And I'm gonna look at their times and determine whether or not this energy drink would be helpful for a football player's performance, okay? Um, that's not good validity. The reason that that was a bad test as it relates to validity is doing a one mile run doesn't really measure football performance, right? That's not very specific to that sport. So that wouldn't be a good choice for a test, okay? Something better that maybe we could do for football would be a 40 yard dash, or maybe we wanna do a one RM squat in the weight room or you know maybe we want to do like a pro agility test or something along those lines right so when we think about validity it's important that we understand if the test what the test is measuring and understand if that's truly what it is that we want to know about okay um reliability is reproducibility or consistency of the results over several trials okay so again imagine that i'm, I'm working with the football team and um, we give some of them energy drinks, we're giving some of them are not getting energy drinks, okay? Um, but I can't test all 100 football players in one day, so I broke them up into three days, okay? And on day one, you know, half of my participants have the energy drink and half do not. Day two, same thing. Day three, same thing, okay? So I've got like 30 players per day doing the test. On day one, it's like 65 degrees, it's nice and cool, it's not humid, it's weather's perfect, okay? On day two, we come out and it's freaking hot as shit, it's 90 degrees out, it's humid, okay? Then on day three, we come out and it's pouring down rain, it's super windy, okay? And we're doing all these tests outside on the track. That's not gonna produce a whole lot of consistency um, of our results over trials, okay, because I didn't control for the environmental conditions, right? So again, if I can't do them all in the same environmental condition, then I'm going to lose some of my reliability. Um, objectivity is a, is a specific type of reliability, and this is high reliability with different researchers, okay? So let's say one of the things that I wanted to understand about these football players was, um, number one, if the energy drink would enhance their mile 
time or whatever we decided, whatever test we did. Um, but also I wanted to know if the energy drink, um, if there was any effect of the energy drink as it relates to like their body fat percentage. So maybe I had, you know, half of them had it throughout the whole season and half of them uh, didn't have any of that throughout the season. So again, we want to test their body fat percentage. Okay. Um, let's say that I'm working with the football players and then I have a student researcher who's also helping me out. Okay. Um, so um, let's say I am testing football player A and I get 11.8% for his body fat percentage. Okay. Then my student researcher goes and tests that same football player and gets 14.8%. Okay. We had bad objectivity, right? So the um, body fat percentage that we got was significantly different. So we didn't have good reproducibility or consistency amongst ourselves. Okay. So now imagine that I test a uh, football player B. Okay. And football player B has a body fat percentage of 8.9%. And now my student researcher comes in and takes that same person, person B's uh, body fat percentage and gets uh, 8.6. Okay. So again, that was very good objectivity. So our consistency was very good for subject B. Okay. Um, a couple different... I have notes for these. I don't know what I did with them. I guess they didn't print out. That's okay. We're going to go without them. Um, a couple different types of, of research design that I think are important for us to understand. We have cross-sectional design, we have longitudinal research, and then we have dose-response relationship. Um, so let's start down here with uh, dose-response relationship. Um, so for dose-response relationship, I want to understand um, a variable that's on a continuum and how that might affect uh, the dependent variable. Okay. So for dose-response, maybe I want to understand if um, the energy drink that we've been talking about affects their performance and um, I want to know what dose is optimal though. Okay, so maybe we already know that this energy drink is going to help them, but we want to know like how much they need to be taking. Okay, so we have um, some players, we have one group that's taking one can a day, we have another group that's taking two cans a day, and then we have a third group that's taking three cans a day. Okay, so again, I want to understand, um, you know, how much is optimal as it relates to their performance, okay? So I can have groups when I do dose response as long as those groups can be sequenced, okay? So like a low, medium, high or something like that. Um, I can also do it without groups as well. So maybe I want to know um, the relationship, like maybe this is like a correlation or a regression um, type of study. And I want to know the relationship between the number of hours studied and um, your overall GPA. Okay, so I want to know like the hours that you study per week and how that correlates to your GPA at the end of the day. Okay, so again, we don't have to put them in a classification. You could study one hour per week or you could study 50 hours per week, right? So again, um, we don't have to classify you in a category, but that variable is on a continuum, how many hours you're studying. Okay, so that's a dose response relationship. Longitudinal research design looks at one group over time, okay? Um, so again, if I wanted to understand the effect of, um, I don't know, vaping on my overall health, you know, down the road, I'm going to take a group of people that vape and a group of people that don't vape right now, like maybe I take Laura's students or whatever, and I'm going to track them over the rest of their life. Okay, that's basically what epidemiology is. I'm going to track and see what diseases they develop and um, what they die from. I know that sounds super like morbid, but that's essentially what epidemiology is, is understanding like what happens to these people as a result of one particular behavior, or one particular choice or um, something along those lines, right? So that's what longitudinal research, research is. I'm going to take a group of subjects and then study them over time. Um, Cross-sectional research allows me to put people into groups and look at those groups um, at one particular time point, okay? Um, so 
when I think about cross-sectional design, um, a few years ago, I did a study with the cross-country team, for example. Half of the members of the cross-country team did muscular endurance exercise in the weight room, and the other half of the team did plyometric uh, exercises in the weight room, okay? So with cross-sectional design, you were assigned to one group, and that was it, right? I wasn't tracking you over your life or anything like that. We did one intervention and then we looked to see what happened um, after the use of, you know, either type of, you know, weight room method, okay? So that's cross-sectional um, is looking at uh, splitting people into separate groups, depending on whatever, and then um, analyzing them in that one given time point. Longitudinal, we're looking at change over time with one group and then dose response, again, I wanna understand um, how a sequential variable might affect your dependent variable, um, you know, yeah, basically. Oops. So, did that come next? Yeah. So again, when we think about uh, research and setting up a study, um, and again, we'll do some practice with this when we get to our Zoom classes absolutely, or in class as well. Um, I want you to think about some, some research controls and a control condition is a standard against which other conditions can be con compared in a scientific experiment, okay? Um, so again, when I do a control condition, maybe like when I'm using, um, I wanted to know if uh, this pharmaceutical drug is going to um, do whatever, right? So. Um, maybe it's supposed to lower my blood pressure or something or um, decrease depression, okay? So I have to have some sort of other standard to compare it to, right? How do I not know that these people that are using this drug aren't just having lower levels of depression because it's now summer out and maybe their depression was, um, you know, like seasonal depression or something along those lines. Okay. So I have to have some sort of standard to control them to. So maybe I have a control group as well. That's not taking the medication. Okay. Um, another example of this. So let's say I wanted to look at the effectiveness of, um, well, we already gave an example of this. We said something like, you know, a uh, carbohydrate meal versus not a carbohydrate meal and how it affected 5k performance. Okay. So the control condition was we let the athlete eat whatever they wanted. It wasn't a, necessarily a high carb meal. They could just have whatever. Okay. Versus a true high carb meal. And we wanted to determine if the high carb meal group did better than the group that could just do whatever. So control conditions allows us to produce the most accurate results and allows us to ensure that the changes that we see in the dependent variable are actually due to the changes um, from the independent variable. So carb versus not high carb or whatever. Okay. So what types of controls could we use to ensure validity and reliability? Um, so again, I want you to kind of think about this and we'll have a question on this in our first lab. Okay. Um, again, we think about research stages we kind of already touched on this, but you need to select a problem. Um, again, consider what, what it is that you're interested in understanding. Uh, review the literature. What else has already been done in the, this area of, you know, whatever it is, okay? Um, do some uh, background research on that, okay? So that's your review of literature. Then you want to design how you want to run your experiment. How can you um, provide insight to this topic in an area that's not already been covered, okay? Um, then you're gonna collect your data, analyze your data, interpret and report your results, and then discuss why it is that you found what you found or why you think you found what you found, okay? So again, that is just a nice little intro to exercise physiology. Um, the next unit that we'll cover, I believe is a few days and we'll be getting into um, the uh, metabolic processes. So I hope you have a great day and I look forward to um, sharing lecture two with you here soon.